Hello there, friends. This is Spencer Michaud, and welcome to your weekly astrology forecast for the week of February 17th through February 23rd. Hope that you are all doing well out there. Uh, I just wanted to give you a heads up before we get started today that the weekly forecasts are now up on Apple Podcasts. So if you are a fan of podcasts and, and want to listen to the show uh, via audio or through that particular service, it's live up there. It's, it's uh, called Spencer Michaud Astrology, just like the YouTube channel and the SoundCloud channel that we have. So um, yeah, and it would be a, a great service to me if you were able to just click that subscribe button and, and give it a rating or, or leave a review. That helps uh, increase the visibility of the, of the show and, and get more listeners. So yeah, that's exciting. I'm not exactly sure why I hadn't done that before. I, maybe it's just uh, the timing is just right now, uh, but it was fairly easy to do and you just put your feet up there and, and away we go. So <laughs> exciting expansions happening for the uh, weekly forecast here. I'm hoping to put up some new, some new videos too or new, new uh, offerings as far as like more evergreen content as well with like teaching videos. I'm uh, going to be doing a, a thing for Pisces this week coming up. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, one other thing I wanted to give you a heads up about is uh, I just recently appeared on a podcast by uh, Melissa LaFara, who is out in the San Diego area. Her podcast is called Energetic Principles. So keep your eyes peeled for that. We go through the, um, the month of February and Pisces season. So uh, she's really a really nice, wonderful lady. And uh, we had a really good time chatting. So there'll be a link for that uh, in the, the show notes for this particular video uh, and on the YouTube channel. Um, that should go live on Sunday, very late on Sunday night, Monday morning. So make sure you check that out and do give uh, Melissa the same treatment and make sure you subscribe to her and, and share share the the podcast with everyone because that can help help her out too because she, she deserves it. She does a lot of great work. So if you're listening, Melissa, thank you for all the good work that you do and very happy to be a guest on your show. Um, okay, so let's get into it. Uh, so this week we have the sun moving into the sign of Pisces, which is correlated with the eight of cups. So we'll discuss that. I'm going to do a little bit of a mini overview of Pisces uh, uh, as we move along in the forecast here. Talk about Jupiter and, and the, its host. Uh, Jupiter will be making a sextile to the planet Neptune on Thursday the 20th. Uh, Friday the 21st, Mars is going to be trining Uranus. Uh, that's going to be cool. That Mars is in its exaltation now, so I think there's going to be some pretty cool earthy things happening with that trine. Uh, Saturday the 22nd, the sun will make a positive sextile to the planet Uranus. And then on Sunday the 23rd, we have our new moon in this, at 4 degrees Pisces. So that's going to be uh, uh, some, some interesting new, new seeds and divine assignments we'll be getting. Uh, last aspect of the week, uh, non-lunar aspect, is Venus will be making a square to Jupiter. So uh, some, some things we're going to have to work out with the, with the benefics at the end of the week here. Um, of course, the other thing that's important this week is Mercury is, is stationing retrograde very late on Sunday night as, I'm, you know, as you're going to be listening to this. And we're going to be kind of going through the Mercury retrograde process over the course of the week. Um, so that is something that will be kind of the, the specter that is hanging over our heads for the, for the week here. Uh, don't worry, it's not, it's not so bad. You just need to kind of let go. Like I say, I, I say this over and over again, but let go of the oars uh, of, the, of the ship and let yourself be divinely guided uh, by what needs to happen. Um, you know, in the Hellenistic times, a lot of the astrology was explained with uh, ocean metaphors, with ship metaphors, with seafaring metaphors. So I like that. Let go of the oars. Let go of the steering wheel. Uh, there is a some sort of wind that is taking you in a in maybe an unexpected direction, but it's probably one that's going to hopefully lead you back to where you know, back to center, back to essence, back to where you're um, where you're supposed to be heading. A lot of times we get a little bit off track because our, our will and the planetary will takes us in directions that may not be good for us and may not be uh, furthering our, our collective journey. And every once in a while we get these, these divine course corrections. And I, I've found that the easiest thing to do is allow them to happen with acceptance and surrender. So that, that is going to be part of our, our journey this week. 
uh, the Essential Dignities Report. Um, the sun is going to be, let, let's, I'm going to share my screen here for those of you watching on video and explain it the best I can for those listening on the audio, uh, doing double duty here. Uh, so we see that the sun is going to start out in the sign of Aquarius, 27 degrees, uh, almost 28, and we'll be moving into the first five degrees of Pisces. In Aquarius, the sun is, is of course, in its exile or in a, in a temple that is uh, contrary to its nature, the temple of Saturn, right? So it's still kind of the, the last first day or two of the week. Um, it's going to be still a solar condition that is not favorable for the sun. Um, as we move into Tuesday, though, the sun will move into Pisces, where it is not in its exile, but it's said to be peregrine. It's like a wanderer. It doesn't have any real essential dignity. Um, I'm not exactly sure which one is better or worse. I, I feel like the exile is probably worse if you're in a temple that you're not really happy with, but uh, I, I don't know. There may be some ancient authors that think that having no dignity at all, even if it's bad dignity, is worse. So we'll see. Uh, it's just a different vibe. Um, the sun will be on the terms of Saturn for the last degrees of Aquarius, 25 to 30 degrees, and then it'll move into the terms of Venus in the first five degrees of Pisces. So uh, I think that that will improve our condition. We've got to, you know, we have the sun being in the house of a benefic rather than a malefic, uh, and then on the terms of a benefic rather than a malefic. So uh, the only challenges I could see with that with the sun is that both of those benefic planets right now are in uh, are ill dignified? Jupiter being in its fall and Venus being in its exile. So that may make for some uncomfortable moments, but we'll 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 dive into that a little deeper as we go. J Jupiter, like I said, is in its fall in, in the second decan of Capricorn, uh, where it's sort of at the bottom of the wheel of fortune. Um, Jupiter is trying to uh, do things like expand and affirm and confirm and help us get a transcendent spiritual reality, but it's being given the resources by Saturn, which is all about limitation, all about kind of get coming to terms with the entropy principle and material reality, and that is very un-Jupiter-like. So uh, we may be a little bit too focused with uh, expanding our material realities and uh, a little bit too aware of this, the, the limitations that we have in, in this material world. Um, and that can create some uncomfortable feelings and feeling like we're not, it, it can leave us with a little bit of a depressed, heavy feeling where Jupiter generally is trying to bring us a hopeful period, a hopeful experience. Uh, and we'll talk about that as we talk about Pisces season. I really think that this Pisces season is going to be about trying to find hope after we've kind of been crushed and beaten down a little bit by Saturn-Pluto conjunctions, by Jupiter being ill-dignified. Uh, you know, by the sun being in exile, there's all these things where we're feeling an uncomfortable feeling that may lead to a somewhat of a feeling of hopelessness. And I think that as we move into Pisces season, it's going to be challenging us to figure out why we're doing what we're doing again. And I think that will be a good thing, reconnecting to center. All right. We may have to reconnect from a, a lowered position because Jupiter is in its fall. But I think that it's going to be something where even if we're starting from, a, from the bottom of the well, uh, so to speak, right? That, that was another way they described uh, fall or depression was being at the bottom of a well and only being able to see a little tunnel of light. Uh, maybe this is the moment where we are starting to maybe uh, climb up the well. Uh, you know, maybe someone's lowered down a, a rope to get us out of the bottom and it's a long journey up to the top. Uh, but even if we're starting from that lowered position, we have to still connect with that our higher selves. And I think that's going to be part of the journey this week. Uh, Saturn is going to be in the third decan of Capricorn, where it is in its own domicile. It's in the terms of Mars from 26 to 30 degrees. It is very strong right now. We still have a very strong Saturn. It's only going to move about a degree. You can see in our chart here that both those outer planets of Jupiter are only going to move about one degree where Saturn is moving about, oh, I don't know, not even a degree. So they are moving very slowly. Um, and uh, Saturn, you know, Saturn's very strong in the sign of Capricorn. It's getting ready to move into Aquarius next month, where the, the mood should lighten a little bit. It's still going to be a very strong Saturn in its own domicile, but it's going to be in an air sign versus an earth sign. So this is a time where it's time to kind of really 
come to terms with some of your physical limitations and, and just to finish uh, administrating the plan that you've, you've been uh, trying to build over the course of this Saturn and Capricorn period. Uh, you know, this decan of, of uh, Capricorn is ruled by the sun. So this was kind of like someone seated on the throne uh, where they have made a plan. They've decided where they're going to build two of pentacles. They've made a blueprint, three of pentacles, and then they have uh, created some sort of achievement energy, but then they have to, to manage all of it. So we're still kind of Saturning up as far as how we are managing all of the uh, things that we've been building lately. And that may they feel a little heavy, like the, when we build something, there, there comes responsibility with that. You know, with great power comes great responsibility, Spider-Man. So, so all you spiders, all you spideys, neighborhood Spider-Men out there and women out there, like, like it's, you've built something, you've gotten some power, and now you have to, uh, you know, be responsible for it. And that can feel heavy at times. Um, Venus is going to be moving through the first decade of uh, Aries uh, from, let's see here, 10 degrees to 18 degrees. Venus moves a little bit faster than those other outer planets. Um, she is in her exile right now, but also in her own terms from 6 to 12 degrees of Aries. She will be moving into the, the terms of a retrograde Mercury from 12 to 20 degrees. So there may be some conversations that need to ha happen uh, that may be a little bit confusing in our relationships. They may be based on some things that we have as far as a differentiated awareness uh, of, of you and the other. Um, this is something we're going to talk about with Venus and Aries. Um, the Two of Wands was correlated with, the, with Venus in the first decade of Aries. Actually, uh, oh, look, at, look at what I've done here. Mercury tried to get me again. Mercury, Venus is not in the first decan of Aries this week. It's in the second decan. Uh, so it's not the two of wands, it's three of wands. Um, and the three of wands, let's see, let's go back to our tidy book here because I prepared something with two of wands. Thanks, Mercury. You got me. <laughs> but let's look at it. Um, since I referenced this book, you can see this is 36 Faces by Austin Kopic. And uh, I believe that the second decan was called the crown and this was the solar ruled decan where we're we have venus's degree of exaltation i'm sorry the sun's degree of exaltation at 19 degrees of aries and venus is going to be coming pretty close to that that degree so this may be about really finding a sense of identity within relationships um yeah this is a solar ruled decan i'm just going to read a little paragraph from him because he's such a great writer and i tend to paraphrase what he writes but it's sometimes it's good to go right back to it. It says, Venus is in her traditional detriment in Aries, and thus the natives are prone to encounter difficulties in her sphere. Those born with Venus in this decan may have desires which far exceed their ability to satisfy them. Nonetheless, if these wild roses can be trimmed back, there is power here to create an aesthetic, aesthetic continuity to reality, to knit together life's many elements with an artistic flourish. These natives often have the ability to incite lust in others, and many are adept at seducing others to enter their reality. If badly afflicted, there may be a terminal distaste for the entirety of lived reality. Uh, though it may be of some use in addressing issues born of low self-regard, Venus is generally weak in this decan and is not recommended for a permanent talisman. Yeah, he talks about talismanic magic in this book as well, which is pretty neat. Um, really great book. Uh, so, yes, Venus is not at her happiest in this particular place. Remember, she was being given resources by Mars, who is now in his exaltation, which is good. Um, but it's like we're being given uh, swords to, to make peace with. Uh, we're being given like instruments of war to try to bring some sort of uh, harmony. And that, that, that's an awkward position for Venus. Now, the three cards associated with the Aries Deccans were the Two of Wands, the Three of Wands, and the Four of Wands. And in that narrative, we see someone trying to holding a globe in the two of wands. Okay, you can see this if you can see this in my little video here. But we see someone holding a globe, looking out over his his dominion. They called that card. So he looking over his his territory and, and making a plan really. And and the, this um, that first icon was called the axe by Austin Kopic, and it was about the the differentiated awareness of of the separation from the mother. 
right? So, every, you know, as we come into this world, we, we start out in the womb in this unity with cosmic consciousness, with the mother, with the mother archetype, with the womb. And then when we're born, we're, we're separated from it. And, and I think that a lot of the airy story is about becoming your own individual, about recognizing that you are separate uh, as a uh, consciousness, as separated from the mother, from the womb. And sometimes that can be painful. And remember, Mars was the, the quality of severance, and Mars is the traditional steward or ruler of the sign of Aries. So this is something where we feel that martial separation, and we have to kind of define who we are uh, identity-wise as a separate entity from something else. And that's what I think Venus is trying to do right now, is we're trying to define ourselves as something different than what we uh, may have thought as, as far as unity goes. Um, you know, just a little anecdote, personal anecdote, like I'm a parent of a teenager, and as a parent of a teenager, you're learning how to, they are learning how to separate themselves and become an individual that is separate from the parent, like, or the parent plant, if you want to think of it as like a, you know, as a, as an earthly metaphor. And sometimes that can be painful. Like it's, it's not necessarily always the greatest thing for harmony between those things. It is necessary for that child or that teen or that adolescent to rebel and start defining themselves differently and that can be painful both for the teenager and for the parent um and but it's a it's a natural process and something that needs to happen for them to survive out in the world without being dependent on the parent so i think that's kind of what we're seeing with venus this week moving through those that that second decan where in the third of th three of wands we see someone who has sent their ships out into the world and some kind of action that was taken, and they're kind of now waiting. It's a waiting period uh, for for the for the result of that action. And in in the um, I'm going to be doing a talk at the Great Lakes Astrology Conference in July, July 9th through the 13th in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Sign up, <laughs> but uh, where I'm going to be talking about the correlation between the Tarot and the Thema Mundi, the natal chart of the world. And in the natal chart of the world, Cancer was on the ascendant. And Aries was on the midheaven. And Aries on the midheaven talks about the praxis and the actions that we take out into the world. And we can see that in the cards where we're, you know, taking some sort of public action and seeing what the results of that are going to be. Um, so that is my long-winded explanation for what, what's going on with Venus this week. Uh, Mars is moving through its uh, uh, exaltation in the first degrees of Capricorn. Um, it's moving from zero to five degrees Capricorn this week. It is on the terms of Mercury, zero to seven degrees. Uh, and as on the terms of a retrograded Mercury, so while we may be like uh, the general, uh, I explained in um, my video last week that Mars and Capricorn is sort of like the strategic general that is making plans and is able to have patience and is really uh, he, he's got like a risk board in front of him and he can see all the territories and he's trying to figure out where he wants to send his troops basically. And, uh, you know, with, with a retrograded Mercury as the term ruler though, there may be some reviewing of where we, what kind of strategy we're wanting to put out there and what territory we're wanting to, to, uh, dominate, so to speak. Um, but patience is a good quality with, with, uh, Mars and Capricorn. This Capricorn being the domain of Saturn, uh, slows slows the uh, the excessive heat of Mars down or cools down the excessive heat of Mars a little bit and g brings a little patience, a little bit of strategic thinking, uh, a little bit of um, uh, endurance to Mars. So instead of burning itself out like it would maybe in Aries where it has this burst of energy, um, it, it is able to to sustain willpower over the long haul. So there may be some, a little bit of review that you're doing in the beginning of the week here as how you want to move forward, but I think it, that quality of patience is going to be very much supported with Mars and its exaltation in Capricorn. Mercury, not in as good a shape as Mars this week, which is, uh, you know, we've got, always got some good, good planets that are functioning at their, to their highest capabilities. Um, and we've got some planets sometimes that are a little bit dysfunctional, and that's just life. Uh, but Mars is, or Mercury is going to be in its uh, traditional sign of exile and fall. Remember, Mercury can hold both of those debilities um, and dignities in the sign of Virgo um, due to its nature to, be, uh, to hold opposites, to be androgynous, to 
uh, you know, go between worlds. Remember, it was the psychopomp that went between the the um, the upper world of, uh, you know, I don't know, is it called the upper world <laughs> and the underworld, right? Uh, it was a messenger between those two worlds, life and death, right? So it's able to hold those two opposites, those two uh, dignities that one one of which the exile is of the nature of the sun and the fall being of the nature of the moon. Uh, but Mercury is going to be really in tough shape this week since it is retrograde. It is in a sign of its stability. It'll be moving through the terms of Jupiter from 12 to 16 degrees and then backing into the terms of Venus from 0 to 12 degrees. Now remember, even though those are benefics, both of those benefic planets right now are in debility as well. So not an awesome time for Mercury things. Um, now, that doesn't mean we can't do, you know, surrender to that Mercury. It just means that our thinking might not be linear, which is what generally a, a well-positioned Mercury can do. It is able to contest and separate out into categories. It's able to communicate clearly without uh, emotional coloration, uh, without subjective thinking. Um, so our thinking is going to be more subjective. Our, our, uh, the way that our mind works is going to be very non-linear, going here to there. Uh, and we're going to be maybe reviewing some things in, our, in the Pisces ruled area of our chart that are connected to the Gemini and Virgo areas of our charts. So just recognize that th communication may be slower. Take time out to like let your mind wander a little bit. Uh, be open to a, a reversal or a course correction or, if, or give yourself extra time if you're doing things like traveling uh, make sure you check all the details twice that you're not being overly subjective in your communication. Uh, ask questions. Don't make assumptions with this Mercury. It's very easy to misinterpret what somebody says because they, they are also subjected to the same influences. Um, it's very easy to misinterpret what people say due to uh, our own um, emotional uh, coloration, our own inner journey. Um, and we should ask questions if we feel confused about something because a lot of times the conflicts that we come across are because we've made an assumption and then we start to brood on it. So with this Mercury retrograde and in its exile and fall, uh, take some time out for yourself, reconnect with your, your own mind and body and spirit, uh, and make sure that if you're putting words out there that you're trying to be as clear as possible, double check everything, uh, Recognize that some mistakes will happen and you don't have to be attached to perfection either. Like some things are just going to blend together and, you, you know, we're going to be able to understand things more in metaphorical terms rather than in very uh, fi linear, figurative, or non-figurative language, right? Figurative language is the metaphorical language. Literal language is, is kind of like, you know, Mercury and Virgo, right? So we may have to get comfortable with fishing metaphors, like I said last week, with uh, like Cla I was referencing Cloudy and the Chance of Meatballs, where uh, Flint Lockwood's dad is, speaks in very, he, he probably has Mercury retrograde exiled in Pisces because he's a fisherman. He doesn't talk a lot. And when he does talk, it's metaphorical. And I think he's a perfect example of this Mercury. It doesn't mean he can't communicate. It just means that uh, there's a lot of layers for it to come through and there's a lot of silence and there's a lot of journeying that he's probably going through internally. He, he does eventually communicate his love for his son, but it is, it is shrouded in like mystery. And it's difficult for uh, Flint, who is very, I would say, probably pretty rational. He's a scientist, right? He's, he's trying to think and th of things in very like rational terms. And uh, there's a disconnect between the two of them that eventually... Uh, becomes bridged, but it just takes a while. And I think that's what's going to happen this, this, this week and this month too. Uh, the moon is going to be waning from the last quarter into its balsamic dark moon phase and then becoming new again at the end of the week. So it's going to be moving through the sign of Sagittarius where it has dignity by face in the second decan, uh, moving through its exile in Capricorn where it does have some dignity by triplicity rulership in the nighttime. So there will be a little bit of communal support with that moon, but it is not a comfortable position for the moon. When the moon moves through Aquarius, it has dignity by face in the final decan, 20 to 30 degrees. And then we're going to see a Pisces moon where it doesn't have a ton of dignity, but it is the cooperating triplicity ruler if you are into things uh, that use that. Okay, those, that, so that's our essential dignity report for the week. Uh, let's move into... Uh, 
just talking a bit about our week via Pisces season. So I'm going to look at just one chart here. I'm going to go to like Monday morning and click the chart over a little bit here. So I always like to start with a kind of the sun on the ascendant or close to it. Okay, so this is Monday morning. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> Mercury's trying to get me. Mercury is moving my chart very quickly, like automatically. It's doing some weird stuff. All right. Uh, on Monday, the only aspect that we have really is the moon making a square to Neptune at 6.48 a.m. And you can see this here, uh, the moon in Sagittarius squaring Neptune at 17 degrees, where we may have uh, a little bit of a challenge uh, in figuring out how to take action on our belief system, right? This is, these are two Jupiter-ruled signs, and Jupiter is in the sign of its fall in a very material place. So Jupiter is, is having difficulty connecting with the higher self, with the higher transcendent integrity, and is kind of concerned with like lower material uh, things. So it is, it's a little bit of a challenging time when we're trying to connect with our higher selves when Jupiter is only being provided for with like heavy uh, form rather than uh, visions. So that, that may be a little bit of a, a bumpy start to our week. Um, as we move into Tuesday, because that's really, like I said, that's the only uh, non, well, it's the only lunar aspect that we have of the day and there isn't any non-lunar perfections that are happening on that day either. So if I move into Tuesday here, that's when we start to get some more action. Uh, Tuesday, the, uh, the sun is going to move into Pisces. And let's just talk about that. Let's unpack that first. And then we'll go into the non-lunar aspects. Sun's moving into Pisces uh, at the end of the day, I believe. Yeah, Let me, I'm clicking it around here. There we go. It's very late, in, very late in the day. Actually, it's almost like Wednesday morning, but let's talk about Pisces first, though, because that's going to be happening. Remember the nonlinear Mercury I was talking about? We're getting there. We're going to get, we're going to get to it. We're going to get through it. Okay. So I've, I have a, a number of notes on Pisces season and Jupiter in general, because I prepared for this wonderful month ahead with uh, Melissa LaFara. So I'm going to review some of that here too. But remember to, to listen to her podcast because she did an awesome job and we go through the entire month and there's some nice witty rapport between the two of us as well, which is a lot of fun. Uh, when two musician astrologers get together, it's, it's, uh, it's good. It's very sing-songy and, and fun. Um, but, but we can't really talk about Pisces season without examining Jupiter. And Jupiter, just very briefly, had a few other names. Uh, one was in the Greek system was Zeus right? The, the, the king of the, of the gods, the, the, uh, the leader uh, in the Babylonian system. Uh, he was named Marduk. Uh, and I'm taking, if you want to know some of the sources of, of what I'm doing, I'm taking a lot of notes from Demetra George's work. Uh, I really like looking at Ren Butler's books. Um, Austin Kopic is another influence. Um, Chris Brennan's work has inspired me. Uh, and I've been doing some research with some source text too, like Rhetorius, uh, and I I've been going through uh, Paulus of Alexandria. So there, there's definitely uh, some interesting things. One other book that I thought was really good, speaking of nonlinear things, uh, I've been studying the hero's journey a little bit with Pisces. Uh, Joseph Campbell, the, the Hero of a Thousand Faces, and Carl Jung, um, the, uh, what is that book? It was called um, Man, Man and His Symbols. And there's another book I like called The Writer's Journey, I don't remember the author of this, but this is kind of about a really great book about how uh, Hollywood use, use the hero's journey in, their, in a lot of their films, um, but we'll talk about that. Anyway, uh, Zeus and Marduk, both of them are, are kind of like kings that faced a dragon that, and they eventually brought cosmic order to the world. Um, they, they battled these like fierce monsters, finally defeated them, were crowned king of the gods, established order, and, you know, were able to um, become guardians of, of law, justice, wisdom, and fate. So they were the arbiters of fate, of the human potential, and things like that. Uh, Jupiter 
was called the greater benefic, right? The doer of good. It is the planet that brings us good stuff. It is the planet that is uh, in the medieval system has the qualities of warmth and moisture, uh, which is conducive to life. It is the things that are bringing things into the world and, and feeding and fueling things. Uh, now, like I said, as I've been saying, Jupiter is in a sign of death right now, and that is making it more difficult to bring things into being. Um, but Jupiter's still Jupiter. It's trying to birth, but only given resources of Saturn right now. And that's really coloring our Pisces season as well. Uh, it, Jupiter's of the diurnal sect, uh, which is the daytime uh, team of planets. Um, Demetri George talks about Jupiter as being relief from troubles, freedom of bondage, friendship with eminent people, uh, the favor of leaders and of the masses. It, of course, rules the day Thursday. It has a 12-year cycle. It was the significator of childbearing and childbirth, children. It rules the thighs, the feet, the liver, the sperm, and the uterus. <laughs> okay. And in Pisces, the feet are, are particularly highlighted, right? Because Pisces rules the feet. Um, and or Pisces was, you know, the one thing that they do with the, 12, the, the signs and equal houses, um, a lot of the times in modern astrology, the 12th house was associated with Pisces. Uh, and then we correlate all the planets ar around with that, which, which generally I think is uh, somewhat of a mistake to do that 12 letter alphabet because they didn't really do that in traditional astrology. But one thing that they, they, they do correlate with houses and, and signs is body parts. And the 12th house was associated with uh, the feet. And uh, of, of course, Pisces is, is sort of um, associated with that as well. Um, so some archetypes for Jupiter, the, the sage, the priest, the judge. Uh, Robert Schmidt calls uh, the Jupiter the, the, the the judge in the cosmic courtroom and somebody who is trying to bring a judgment and to confirm or be a bridge between things. Uh, generosity was associated with Jupiter. Remember, it was kind of like cosmic Santa Claus. I, I made the comparison of Jupiter to King Triton in Pisces because it's an ocean metaphor, right? Um, it's it's a, concerned with law, with morals, with religion, ethos, ethics, spirituality, the pursuit of something successful, the pursuit of some higher transcendent reality. Uh, so that's what Jupiter is, and that, that really is defining our, our Pisces characteristics. Now, Pisces as a sign is of the water element. It is, it is, um, it is of the mutable, double-bodied, um, uh, kind of bicorporeal or uh, kind of quality where it is about change. It's about the transition from the winter into the spring where everything is, you know, the frozen ground is melting and all the water is merging with the mud and we've got this primordial soup for creation. It is a feminine nocturnal temple. Uh, it is the ninth house of the cosmos in the Thema Mundi. Uh, remember, if we, had, if we had cancer on our ascendant here, then Pisces would be in that ninth house. And the ninth house was associated with spirituality, with taking pilgrimages to find meaning with moving away from the angle at the 10th house. So this is something that I think that Pisces is really about, is moving away from outer action out in the world while simultaneously gazing and reflecting back on the action that we've already taken. So I think that there's like a movement away from material success, which is what we see in the Eight of Cups, but also a review and like saying, well, why are we doing what we're doing? How are we connecting with higher purpose? We're, we're, we've maybe achieved something in the world and, and maybe that material achievement didn't bring us exactly everything that we hoped it would. And we have to venture off in search of some sort of more higher minded, spiritual, moral reality rather than just some material accomplishment. And I, I think that's what we're going to be experiencing here. Now, the, the decans of Pisces, We've got, set. it's the story that's told is we start off with Saturn, the ruler of the first decan, move into the Jupiter ruled decan and the second decan, and then move into a Mars ruled decan in the third decan. And one of the things I've been talking about with Mel, Mel, we're on like, you know, nickname status now. <laughs> it's great. Um, uh, I talked about the, a movie that she, she needs to go see she hadn't seen she I, I blew it with my metaphor with her because she hadn't seen the movie but i talked about the matrix and about neo and the matrix and i think i'm going to explore this further 
in a, in a standalone video. But in general, uh, Neo is, is the hero's journey, right? Neo in the Matrix is the hero's journey where we have Neo, you know, starting off in that Saturnian Deccan, uh, coming to terms with the limitation of his reality, and then coming to a new awareness that that was not all there was. He meets with a mentor, uh, Morpheus. Uh, he gets trained and, and goes into like the idealized world. He, he literally goes into a simulation uh, and learns all these new skills and leaves the ordinary world and then returns with some elixir, with some newfound understanding, returns to that ordinary world and thus becomes a master of it and is giving some gift to that ordinary world. And like I said, I will, I will have a video that I'm planning on making in the next week or so where I'm going to explore that hero's journey with Neo and the Matrix and Pisces season much more in depth, but that's the basic gist of it. And the first decan of Pisces here, we have the labyrinth. So uh, this is where we find ourselves in that matrix, but we may not have a, a mastery over it yet. We're coming to terms with, you know, working in that cubicle, doing, doing the daily grind, and it's just like, oh, this isn't, the, this isn't what's feeding my soul. And we may be going off in search of some new reality. We may be taking uh, I don't know which pill it was, the blue pill or the red pill, but I think we took the blue, the blue pill to wake up or something like that, right? So that may be our experience of this, this time frame. Um, so Pisces is about being flexible too. This is where we just have to really kind of come to terms with the fact that we are in a state of flux where there's some new vision that is trying to coalesce into, into form. And it isn't there yet. And we really have to kind of get in touch with uh, with our belief systems first before we can bring something into form. And I, I really think that's what's going to be happening. We, we've got to get uh, into um, why the why. I think this is the, the key term is the why instead of, instead of the how. I think the how is, is like Virgo season a lot of the time or, or Mercury. Jupiter is the why. Jupiter is saying, why are you doing this? What is, what is the purpose and the meaning? How are you unifying all of these details into one uh, co cohesive whole and vision? And I think that's a great meditation for this next week and month coming up is getting in touch with your inner why and, and hope. Uh, hope is another word that I think is, is very prominent because if we don't have any hope for the future, uh, that why is not going to motivate us to do the how. And uh, once we get in touch with, with the why, the, the how becomes a lot easier. <laughs> like, and if we're just not motivated and we're not feeling some connection to some higher purpose with it, uh, then we're just going through the motions. And that can feel really disempowering and depressing. And I think we do that in our lives every once in a while. We just go through the motions of our life and we aren't connected to some higher spiritual purpose. I, I know that I've been feeling a little bit of that lately myself. Like, you get to, into the daily grind of your daily life. Uh, you have schedules where you just have to kind of put your, put your head down and just do it and carry the burden. And it's very easy to feel a, a sense of disconnect, uh, even if you are doing good work. Um, and I think that uh, sometimes we don't realize how far we've actually come in our journey because we're just going through the daily motions and trying to keep our heads above water. And I think this time will be great for reconnecting to that and seeing maybe even just how far we've really come and getting a progress report. And it's okay if you realize that you're not there yet, because with Jupiter and its fall at the bottom of the well, we may be at the very beginning of our journey. And sometimes we begin a journey, uh, like think of it like a role-playing game. I mean, I've been, <laughs> full disclosure, I've, sometimes I'll get sucked into a game on my phone or something like that, and I'm super embarrassed about this, but it's just kind of funny. This, it's, uh, you know, I had Mars in my fifth house conjoining Neptune. This is the most Mars and Sagittarius conjoining Neptune type of thing. There's this game I like, and I hate it to even like mention it by name, but it's like this um, Looney Tunes role-playing game. <laughs> This is so stupid. And like you, you have these, these cartoon characters and you, you level them up. And, you know, it's, it's very addicting. It's very like escapist. And uh, I think I'm coming out of it because I got so much work to do. I just don't even have time to get sucked into that portal of escapism. Uh, but we may be starting from, in, in a role-playing game, you start without, you start at level zero, right? And you have to build over time. 
and kind of like gain experience, gain uh, resources, gain new, I don't know, weapons and armor and shields and skills. And I think that's what we're going to be experiencing a little bit like this. We're starting out at level zero with Jupiter in Capricorn, and we've got to kind of build it up over time. Uh, now, that being said, I wanted to make a disclaimer that life and spirituality, and I learned this from my teacher, Achyuta Bhava of Nightly Astrology, because he definitely uh, makes this a point of emphasis. And I agree with him. As life is not always about leveling up and spirituality is not about leveling up. This is something that is very prominent in our modern uh, evolutionary astrology that, uh, that I don't know that the two of us agree with necessarily. I think that, yes, we want to grow as human beings and grow as souls and whatever, but I think that the, the, the general gist of it is that, you know, it's not always about quote unquote leveling up because that can give us a sense of spiritual materialism too. Um, so I'm speaking out of both sides of, of my mouth here saying that, that we may be experiencing a little bit of this role playing game type of, of thing, but also at the end of the day, uh, you have to just come to terms with um, where you're at. And it's not always about, can you, um, become a level 10 mystic or yogi like like my like a chuta likes to say sometimes you just have to ex, you know accept the fact that you're gonna have to you know not achieve something that there will be failure and ultimately that might be part of the lesson right or that might be just part of the reality is that accepting failure um and then that can lead to hopefully new insights to be 100 percent honest none of us really know what the reality of this is, whether it's, you know, some game that we're leveling up or whether we're just having to accept all the reality. Who, who the hell knows? <laughs> like we're just trying to figure this out the best we can as human beings with limited uh, knowledge. And uh, I think it, that I'm come face to face with my own humility and my own like limitations as far as what we're doing here. I'm just trying to read these symbols, and at the end of the day, hopefully you get some benefit out of it. I, I do not consider myself any kind of guru or like enlightened being or anything like that. Uh, I, I just think that I'm somebody who's very curious about this stuff, and hopefully by sharing my process and my imperfections as an explorer, that helps you on your journey. Um, so, so yeah. Where are we? We're definitely Mercury and Pisces in here. So let's get back to the more linear discussion. On Tuesday the 18th, I'm going to go back a little bit here. Such meandering. I knew this was going to happen, but you know, this is what we've signed up for <laughs> like with, this, with this energy that we're going through here. Okay, on Tuesday the 18th, got some lunar aspects, right? We have the moon making a sextile to the sun when it's still in Aquarius. Okay, here we go with uh, uh, before the moon moves into Capricorn. From, so from the sign of Sagittarius, we've got a final sextile with the lights at the final degrees. So there might be something where we're just kind of really getting the last gasp of what's going on in Sagittarius area of our chart, connecting with the Aquarius area of our chart. Um, then the moon moves into Capricorn at 5.36 a.m., where it is in its exile, so there may feel a little bit of a heaviness that comes on in the middle of Tuesday. And then the moon's going to conjoin the exalted Mars. So moon is a manifester. It's bringing things into being. So that may really trigger our desire to make a plan and to, to build on some new ground and take an action and, and really like become the, that, that army general of our life and really start to direct our willpower in a, hopefully in a more effective manner. Uh, at the end of the day, or actually at lunchtime, 11.44 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, the moon will trine Uranus. So we, the, the action that we're taking may be something that is helping us to break new ground in that Taurus area of our chart, uh, you know, encouraging us to be innovative and to do something that is uh, creating some sort of new structure that we may be uncomfortable with, but is helping us to break that new ground. Now, with Mars into moving into the first decade of, of Capricorn, we're going to see the uh, calasis or the um, connection 
I don't think it's kalesis. I think the, the Greek word is slightly different. But we're going to see the Mars coming in within a three-degree orb of Uranus. I believe kalesis is when they're bonded together in conjunction. I don't remember the, the, um, the other word for it. But uh, we're going to be seeing this, this Mars connecting with Uranus into Earth signs, encouraging us to take actions that are in our own best interest that may be innovative and new and are potentially disruptive, but in a good way, because it's a trine. It's a positive communication between those two, two planets. So we're going to really be feeling that now as Mars is moving into Capricorn. We may be ready to take action on some of those new things that are happening. And I see this in my own life, like uploading my, uh, this, this particular forecast on the Apple podcast. That's like a new thing. It's using technology to expand uh, listenership and audience. So think of things like that, where you can take some sort of um, realized action to help uh, expand and do things in a new and innovative way. The other thing I saw on Tuesday was Venus is in a contra antitia with the sign of Neptune, which is like a, uh, a secret opposition. Okay, you can see this here. Uh, Venus being at about 12 degrees and change of Aries and Neptune being at 17 and change of Pisces. And contra antitia was like when these signs were on uh, equal, equal degrees of the equinox, and this case being the spring equinox. Uh, and this was, these were called hearing signs. The, the antitia signs were when a, a planet was on equal sides of the solstice, and those were called seeing signs. Um, and we have a commanding sign, which in this case is Aries, and an obeying sign, in this case is Pisces. So there's like messages that are being uh, distributed from one planet to another. So Venus is going to be giving like a, a message, maybe in secret, to, to, the, to Neptune here. And there may be some sort of confusion within relationships or rumors or things like that, messages that you hear that are creating some sort of secret confusion in a relationship or perhaps an illusion that we have that is Venus related. We saw a contra last week of uh, the sun and Uranus. Uh, I believe that was on Sunday last week or, or today as I'm recording this. Um, I'm recording this really late because I just had a lot of work this week. Uh, but it's good though. Yeah, the contra antitia was on Saturday evening. Um, so we had some sort of kind of like secret opposition from 26 uh, air Aquarius to uh, three degrees of Taurus. So see if anything happened Saturday night and if there was some kind of secret thing between the sun and Uranus in your chart. And we may experience something similar to that uh, with Neptune and, Pi and uh, Venus. Okay, moving on to Wednesday. So we're not here for a million hours. <laughs> oh, man. I try to be as efficient as possible, but there's just so many things. Astrology, there's so much going on in the chart. It's so difficult for me to just like, you know, just give an overview because I feel, and this is my Jupiter and Virgo talking, uh, as well as Mars and Saturn and Virgo, but it just, it, it, it's so hard for me to just give you like, this is the big thing because there's all these little things happening concurrently. And it, that's what it, was, it was very difficult for me to do a month ahead forecast because my general like, you know, microscopic evaluation of things, trying to do that for an entire month all at once is like, oh my God, I'm going to short circuit my brain out. But we got through it. I like these shorter periods of time though, because then I can do a deep dive into it. Uh, but looking at Wednesday here, looking at Wednesday, uh, the moon is going to be in Capricorn in the balsamic phase, where it is, is in the dark moon phase. You can see the balsamic phase is when we get into that point where there's 45 degrees of arc of separation between the moon and the sun. It's the end of the solar lunar cycle where we're consolidating the seeds for the new cycle that's going to be coming up uh, with the new moon. Right, So this is about kind of what are the lessons that you learned over this last moon cycle. Um, remember, this last moon cycle started off in Aquarius, came to a culmination at the Leo opposition. So it was kind of about feeling like an outsider, uh, defining ourselves by what we are not, figuring out what kind of identity we're going to defend and what we have to leave behind. And that new identity we're going to take into that spiritual journey of, of Pisces where we're starting off trying to figure out now we know who we are. Now we have to figure out how we're going to connect that, that 
identity to some sort of higher purpose. I think that's really what's going to be happening in this new moon here. Uh, so balsamic phase Wednesday, the moon's going to be making a sextile to retrograde Mercury at 3 a.m. at 24 degrees of Capricorn and Pisces. Then the moon's going to be squaring Venus uh, at 13 degrees of Capricorn and, and Aries at 7 a.m. Uh, a conjunction will happen with Jupiter at 2.49 p.m., and then the moon will sextile Merc uh, Neptune at 3.05 p.m. So we have a connection with the retrograde Mercury, uh, where there may be some confused communications at the very beginning of the day. Remember, Wednesday is Mercury's day, too, so <laughs> this day may be fraught with some frustrating communications. Uh, that's also going to create some some challenges within the relationships. Maybe uh, the plan that we're trying to enact, it runs into uh, a difference of opinions with our desires and somebody else's. Uh, and then we are kind of seeing the conjunction with Jupiter, um, where we are trying to bring some expansion into, into place, but we may have to come to terms with the limitations that Saturn is providing for Jupiter. And then with the sextile from the moon to Neptune, uh, two things could happen. We could either transcend the whole thing altogether uh, with Neptune, you know, trying to really connect with spiritual transcendence, or we may be like, screw it. This is too hard. I'm going to just go escape and play Looney Tunes on my phone. I'm laughing because that's probably what's going to happen on Wednesday. I'm just going to get overwhelmed and, you know, me and Bugs Money are going to go like, go battle battle uh i don't know porky pig <laughs> whatever it's i'm so embarrassed by it but you know everybody's got their thing everyone's got some escapism thing and i think that what i've been trying to do is realize that if i can limit the amount of escapism during this period of time and like say okay I'm, if that's what i'm gonna do it's only gonna be for like 15 minutes or something and then i need to just like go back and grind it out again i think that's that's a good plan is if you've got your own chosen escapist tendencies, try to set a time limit on it if you can. It's, I think it's okay to like go off and, and be imperfect and let your mind wander a little bit and try to have some fun every once in a while. Uh, but maybe limit it and, and choose some priorities as well. You know, maybe it's a reward for getting something done and maybe it is a treat after you've, you've done the necessary things, Saturn, that, that will lead you uh, to being able to move forward in your life rather than pull you away from that that point of power all right thursday the 20th thursday the 20th i'm going to move a chart forward for those of you listening on the podcast it's fun i have a podcast now it's fun it's exciting it was always a podcast but now it's like officially quote unquote a podcast so <laughs> I don't know. The cool thing is, is they allow you to up, upload a feed on there, an RSS feed. So every episode that I've been doing since last June, which is almost 35 episodes now of the weekly forecast, uh, are going to be archived on there too. So if you missed out on it, if you're just discovering it for the first time, go back and listen to some of the old ones too, because I don't just do the forecast. I do a lot of teaching of concepts and terms. Um, and, and I eventually want to start separating those out so that they're a little bit more easier to find. Um, but that's why these are s such longer explorations, because I like to do teaching uh, concepts as well as just saying, this is what the weather is going to be like. So there's a lot of content on those old ones. So go check them out. Uh, and if you like it, give it the five stars. <laughs> All right. So Thursday, the 20th. It is my dad's birthday. Happy birthday, dad. Uh, yes, I have a Piscean father. Uh, as a Cancerian, we, we vibe on the, on the water, the waterways of life. Um, the moon will be in Capricorn, moving into uh, Aquarius at 2.41 p.m. We're continuing our balsamic moon phase. <clears throat> the moon is going to be making a conjunction to Pluto, bringing up maybe some things from the underworld that need to be dealt with in the sign of Capricorn uh, at 3.06 a.m. It will then conjoin Saturn uh, at 9.18 a.m. Uh, and move into Aquarius at 2.41 p.m. and then square Uranus at 9.13 p.m. The non-lunar aspect of the day is Jupiter making a sextile to uh, Neptune at 10.56 a.m. Okay, so let's break this down. Anytime the moon's been moving through Capricorn lately, it's making contact with Pluto and with Saturn like simultaneously, really. And the order changed with that recently as the Saturn-Pluto conjunction perfected and then Saturn started to move past Pluto. 
before it was like we came to term with limitations and then we had to dive into the underworld and deal with the corruption and whatnot. Now we're getting in ter- coming to terms with Pluto first uh, in, the, in the linear aspect uh, where we're kind of seeing the corruption and then we're able to take action on that corruption with, with Saturn. We're able to say, okay, this isn't working. I need to change this. I need to let go of this. I need to restructure this in this way. And I think that's how we experience these, these kind of moon conjunctions with Saturn and, and Pluto. So Thursday may be a day where you're, something is bubbling to the surface that needs to be dealt with. Uh, and then by the end of the day, when it moves into Aquarius with that square to the moon, uh, with, I'm sorry, that square to Uranus, uh, we've got some sort of new thing that we're trying to bring into being that, that it may need some feedback from the group or from where we are feeling like uh, and up, go, rising above our life and observing something and observing maybe what isn't working through that uh, moon uh, conjunction with Pluto and Saturn. And then we have to kind of like, like reevaluate what's going on as far as how we're using our resources at the end of the day. Now, the Jupiter-Neptune sextile. One of the things that I've been doing lately with, with longer term uh, cycles is examining them from uh, in, a, in a synodic perspective. Like where was their seed? Uh, this is something I'm starting to write in my notes is every time I see a non-lunar aspect, I'm writing the seed of that. And the seed is when those two planets came together in a conjunction. So the seed of this aspect was a Jupiter-Neptune conjunction at 24 degrees of Aquarius on the 20th of December, 2009. So this is a, a, a point a, a point of feedback in that larger cycle. So look at the Aquarius ruled area of your chart, and this is going to be the balsamic sextile of Jupiter and Neptune, where remember we talked about balsamic moons where we're consolidating all the seeds to kind of uh, for the new start, right? It's because we're getting closer and closer and closer to a new uh, Jupiter Neptune start again when Jupiter moves into Pisces. I don't know if it's gonna if Neptune's still gonna be in Pisces when Jupiter moves. It might be. I have to look at it. But but we've got another year or two of Jupiter moving through Capricorn and then Aquarius, and then when it moves into Pisces, we're gonna have that new start again. So this is like a, a phase where we're incorporating some of these things in and kind of reevaluating uh, and and in digesting all of the lessons that we've had. Uh, and, you know, the, the, cu- the cards associated with this was the Three of Pentacles for Jupiter and the Nine of Cups for Neptune. So we've got Grand Idealism, uh, Oceanic Ecstasy. These are notes from Ren Butler's book, Expansive, The Expansive Dream, Sacred Spiritual Journey. Um, the plan, the Three of Pentacles, Jupiter, meets the net, the prime materia of Pisces, Deccan number two. So I, I wrote down in my notes that we're diving into the soul to create some sort of material form. So there may be something where you're bringing out uh, something into form that was born of an of a expansive vision. And the sextile is harmonious. The sextile is where we might be getting some assistance for that. Uh, so remember, sextiles were of the nature of Venus. And Venus is where we're getting a boost from some of the people in our life. Uh, so, and I, I've seen this, like, I'm very grateful to my friend, Melissa LaFara, for inviting me on her podcast because that's, that's a great opportunity. You know, she's got an awesome audience and, and hopefully like uh, that'll help me get exposed to her audience and I will expose her to my audience. It's a, it's a very Venus type of thing. And like that's an example from my life, but you may be having assistance from somebody uh, beneficial in your life. I thought it's even um, more interesting that like, you know, Venus generally represents women. So potentially you get a, a boost from some sort of feminine figure in your life or maternal figure or, or a female figure in your life as well. That could be a possibility also. All right. Um, Friday the 21st. Let's move forward in the chart. Okay. On Friday, the moon is going to be in Aquarius. And it is going to be still in the last stages of that balsamic phase. Remember, when the moon is waning like this, this is a time for letting go of stuff. This is a time for, you know, reevaluation, for incorporating the lessons into our life. It's not the greatest time to start 
uh, something completely new, uh, although th there's never a perfect time to start things. And, and remember, the solar lunar cycle is just one cycle that is in the process of happening. There's all these other relationships between the planets. So while there may be a, a, a letting go in one area of your life, there may be a beginning in some other area of your life. Uh, and that's, man, it's just such a beautiful dance that we're, that we're experiencing here. Uh, so on Friday, the big aspect of the day uh, is the Mars trine with Uranus. Okay. Now we have one lunar aspect. The moon, the moon is going to be making a sextile to Venus in Aquarius. So you could see the moon from 15 degrees Aquarius making a positive sextile to Venus. So there may be some sort of assistance that you receive uh, from the um, from the Aries and Aquarius ruled areas of your chart where there's some harmony between those two topics. Okay. Okay, so look at your own chart and see that there, what kind of topics are represented by those two houses. And if you need help with that, I'd be more than happy to set up a, a reading and explore your chart with you. Uh, I love, 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 love doing readings for people. And uh, that is the, the best way that you could support the work that I do is scheduling a reading beyond just sharing and liking and things like that. But if you want to if you want to materially support the, the, the work I do and get something valuable out of it for yourself, scheduling a reading is, is number one on the list. Okay, so let's, let's dissect this Mars at three degrees of Capricorn, sextiling Uranus, I'm sorry, trining, trine. I'm going fast today. I'm going, I'm, I'm going fast, I'm doing this in the morning. Swim meet in the afternoon, <laughs> so I got to get it all in here before I have to go sit uh, swim meet for five hours, which will be fun. I love it. It's just uh, a lot of a lot of contact hours as a parent, and sometimes you have to balance these things out, right? So we have a trine between uh, Mars and Uranus, and trines were of the nature of Jupiter, which were the greater benefic, which were communal support, whereas Venus was like a harmonization with relationships. You know, Jupiter was the wind in your sails, so to speak. So there may be a positive boost that is happening between with the conversation between these two planets. Now, the cool thing is, is Mars is very dignified right now. So what does Mars represent? Mars represents will. Mars represents uh, being able, the quality of uh, asserting ourselves, of taking action out into the world. It also, as a malefic, represents severance, separation, and conflict. But I think in this case, Mars is functioning at its very best in its exaltation. So we're able to take actions that really, I think, will serve us very well with Mars and Capricorn. And it's making a trine to Uranus, that Promethean uh, energy that is kind of moving us forward in the new chapter of our life in, in the Taurus world area of our chart. So there's a very earthy harmonization between the actions that we take based on our blueprint and our plan and, and learning where we want to build. Remember the first decade of Capricorn was that two of pentacles where the, the themes that I am understanding on this is that this is about first decade Capricorn is about where are you going to build your dream? So Mars right now is saying, I'm going to take action about where I'm going to put down the roots. And it's very well supported for you to like see very clearly where you may be able to take a positive action in your life that'll bring uh, honors and benefit eventually. And it's going to be by doing something new and innovative. Okay. Uh, this is the disseminating phase of the Mars Uranus cycle. It's is another kind of phase where we're finally seeing the results of our action of the Mars-Uranus conjunction that happened at 29 degrees of Aries on the 13th of February, 2019. So go back to 2019, look at the Aries ruled area of your chart and see what seed was planted there. Now I'll tell you what seed was planted in my life. That's the ninth house of my life. That's you know, ninth house, astrology, you know, teaching, uh, you know, sharing wisdom, things like that. And that was a time I'd, I'd, you know, 
was starting to do much more astrology, transitioning a lot more from my uh, musician stuff into astrology stuff. And now I'm feeling more comfortable with this. I'm feel, I, I've done a lot of education work with, with Nightlight Astrology and my teacher at Chuta Baba, and I'm starting to expand the offerings that I'm doing and things like that. And it's a, it's a moment of fruit, right? Fruiting. It's where the, we see the ripening of the fruit cycle that was planted there. And that was, you know, when Uranus was moving through my ninth house, that's when I discovered traditional astrology. I, I completely got a lightning bolt of awareness of a, a brand new system of thinking about the world and thinking about my place in it and how, what it means and cosmic cosmology in general, cosmic organization. Uh, it, it shattered my worldview. And now we're seeing uh, uh, some sort of harmonious relationship between that as we come to the you know, final cycle, the final stages of this cycle, the disseminating phase, right? What, before we get another uh, Mars-Uranus conjunction, I think, uh, during Taurus season, right? So always look at these, these aspects, these non-lunar and lunar aspects, really, in context of the greater narrative of your life. I, I can't stress that enough. And that, that is what is really liberating about studying astrology is when we see something good, we can appreciate it and celebrate it, when we, and, but not get too attached to it because we know it's going to change. When we see a negative aspect like a square, we realize that it's just one part of the cycle that is, is part of our soul's journey and part of our story, our collective narrative. So we, can't, we don't get too fixated on what negative is happening because it's, there is ups and downs. This is a wheel. This is a, a spinning globe that we live on. And it's a spinning wheel of, of karma and fate. And when, when we have a circle, uh, any point on it can be just uh, uh, related to the other point, <laughs> okay? So, um, yeah, I think if we start thinking of life in, as cycles and s- instead of linear, um, linear thinking, that's going to help us a lot more. It's very difficult to think that way, I think, sometimes, because as human beings, we're just, you know, we're always watching the clock, right? We're always watching uh, one day to the next in the calendar and marking off the days. And I think when we get into that kind of experience of that universal time, which is very different than, than material time, I think, it's, it's very centering. All right, so that is Mars trining Uranus. Uh, like I said, very earthy. Another note that I had was the general Mars in Capricorn makes an unexpected but advantageous maneuver, a surprise attack, a blitzkrieg to claim the new territory. Uh, so what is your blitzkrieg going to be? Uh, what is your surprise maneuver that you're going to do in your life that's going to help you move forward on the, in, the, in the story of your life here? All right, let's move to our weekend. Let's move to our weekend. Okay, so as we move forward onto Saturday morning, uh, we are experiencing a sextile between the sun and Uranus. So we maybe we take some action that is very liberating and unexpected and earthy and practical. And this is helping us to see the beauty of our own. Uh, identity, solar identity within this new uh, persona that we are putting on, right? This new, this new um, manifestation of our higher self into form. And uh, this is also a balsamic phase of this solar lunar, I mean, solar, solar Uranian cycle. So this is, an, again, where we may be assisted in creating some new identity, the combination of the sun and Uranus uh, by the people in our life, by our relationships. So you may be uh, finding that you have support from the people in your life that are helping you to bring this new identity into physical reality. And the seed of this cycle was, the, was Earth Day 2019, uh, the 22nd of April at two degrees of Taurus. So, so take a look back then and see what, what was trying to be birthed in your life as far as your commanding, authoritative uh, identification presence, the divine light of the mind, the sun, so to speak. Uh, the, the, 
uh, notes I have for this, urges to rebel, Uranus, uh, urges to rebel, uh, um, uh, come against authority, amongst authority, uh, the sun, the breakthrough of identity, individuation, the eight of cups, the sun in, in Pisces, meeting up with the five of pentacles, uh, the, the Uranus and Taurus, um, willful erratic behavior, uh, the willingness to leave an old identity behind to create a new material reality. Because remember, that's what we're being asked to do with Uranus and Taurus here, is, is we've got the, the eight of cups, this sun in Pisces, abandoning some sort of material success or some sort of old way of doing something to come into contact with this new way of doing something. All right. So this is what we're going to be kind of working out as the sun makes that sextile to Uranus. On Sunday, the 23rd. On Sunday, the 23rd. This is when we have our new moon. So I'm going to move forward to the new moon here and we'll unpack that. So there you can see it right there. Four degrees of Pisces. Uh, the moon moves into Pisces at 1.37 a.m. Uh, and then it is going to immediately make a sextile to Uranus. And then the, the moon will be new at 10.32 a.m. And then it'll make a sextile to Mars. The non-lunar aspect of the day is Venus making a square to Jupiter at 11.59 a.m. So that's part of this new moon story. Excuse me, last aspect of the day is the moon conjoining retrograde Mercury. So let's unpack that holistically. See how I'm blending them all together? <laughs> like this is what Mercury is doing. Okay, so let's talk about this new moon, right? So you see we've got new moon at four degrees Pisces. It is, the new moon is sextile, Mars, exalted Mars, and also sextile, Uranus in Taurus. So we've got help on all sides in this. Uh, we've got Venusian, Venusian help uh, with this new journey that we're going to be going on, this new Piscean divine assignment. We've got Mars and Uranus in the mix helping us out, trying to encourage us to take those new innovative actions based on the journey, the Jupiterian journey that we are trying to take. Okay, and in the mix, though, remember Jupiter is going to be making a square to Venus. So we've got all these things happening concurrently. Venus squaring Jupiter, both in their fall. Okay, so one of the things we talked about with the eight of, of cups and remember, this is a, I'll show you, this is a figure of a, uh, a person wandering off into the distance. There's eight cups of attainment and of achievement in front of him. There is a waning moon in the sky. He's wandering off into the wilderness, into the unknown. He's leaving that material success behind in search of some sort of higher reality. And this is very ninth house. This is very, uh, you know, moving away from the angle of achievement, 10th house, while simultaneously gazing back upon it. Those are the, that's the primary motion, okay? The, the clockwise motion that is associated with the motion of the sun, of the divine, and the counterclockwise motion of the zodiac, which is the will of the planets. So that, those two um, concurrent motions, that yin and the yang motion, give us a lot of the house meaning of, in ancient astrology. And that ninth house is a cadent house that is being pulled away from that angle at the top while gazing back upon it. So imagine that you're being pulled off into some complete unknown, but you're reflecting on something. That's what's going on with this new moon. We're being pulled away from, from material reality. We're escaping. We're going off into the unknown, and we're reflecting on what has come before in search of some higher purpose. Now, the challenges with this is that both Jupiter and Venus are in their exile. And they are squared. So our new reality that we're searching for is, is we're going to get fixated on the material aspects of it. And I would encourage you not to get overly concerned with the form that this new impulse is taking because Jupiter is in the sign of Saturn. It can be very uh, heavy 
It can be very materially based in Capricorn. It can be very much about how am I going to build the walls around me, right? So you know what Jupiter is trying to build right now? A fortress. <laughs> like, that's not what Jupiter is trying to do. Jupiter doesn't want to create a fortress. That's why it's in its fall in Capricorn. Like it, he wants to build bridges. So if you're trying to build a fortress around you, you know, make sure that you have a drawbridge that goes across the moat so that you can, you know, have contact with the outside world. Uh, don't try to hem yourself in. This is, this, that's the danger of this. And it may be because you're feeling like separated, Venus and Aries, from the people in your life. And you're trying to differentiate yourself uh, from, from the womb, so to speak, right? And create a new separate identity. And there may be conflicts that come up in your relationships because of your, your attempts to build this fortress around you and to build some new ambitious material reality. Now, the, the danger is that we get too ambitious and we get hubris, right? Like, <laughs> this is, I, I, I'm only, I don't know, I'm thinking of the hubris of trying to build a wall around the southern border of the United States. We're trying to build a fortress around our country to keep all the bad things out and keep all the quote unquote good things in. And, and, and you could see in the news, like the, the flimsiness of this effort, like with the wind basically blowing it down and the hubris involved with trying to build a wall, right? It, it just isn't, what is the higher purpose of that? Is the higher purpose of that, is that divinely inspired? Now, I'm getting a little political here, so I apologize about getting uh, too subjective in my opinion. But my opinion is that, I don't know, I don't want to get too far into it, but I think it's silly. And I think that this country was founded on uh, immig immigration, and I think that everybody here, besides the Native Americans that were you know, abused, are immigrants. And that's what this country is all about. That's what America is all about. And trying to keep out, you know, people that genuinely may need our help or that are, you know, I don't know, I think it's the height of hubris. And I think that there will be a fall eventually associated with that uh, type of thinking. And I, I encourage you, that's one example, uh, one example of, of somebody that I've, I've personally feel, and you're free to disagree with me, we can agree to disagree, misallocating resources to create some sort of fortress. You can see that that's, that's how it's playing out in the collective. And I want you to examine where you're being uh, your own inner, like, oh God, I'm going to piss off all the liberal friends. Where are you being your, your own inner Donald Trump right now? And trying to build a wall in your life to keep something out where that may be based on some kind of hubris that isn't likely serving your higher sense of unity and, and connection, okay? And, uh, and I'm not saying that as like, oh, you're all, everybody is bad or anything like that. What I'm saying is examine where we may be have some flawed thinking and examine where we may be trying to create separation and uh, where, where we need to create unification. Remember, Saturn was the concept of uh, exile, right? It was the, it's the exile. It was the, the, um, the, the banishment, the, uh, oh, what is the word I'm looking for here? Saturn is exclusion. So we are, we, what we're doing is built, we have the danger of trying to build something that excludes others. So I want you to really reflect on that as we move into this Pisces new moon is are you building something that is keeping you separate where, where the desire of Jupiter really is to, to unify things, is to bring people together, to bring a, a universal divinely inspired vision together with material reality. And when we start to do things materially that, that exclude other people, I don't, to me, that's not divinely inspired. Uh, that is not a, a proper use of that energy. And I think that that really is a, an example of Jupiter and its fall. Um, so what can we do? What can we do? Uh, the new moon in Pisces could speak to a disillusionment with material reality that initiates some sort of spiritual pilgrimage. Maybe you've, you've tried to create some sort of walls around you 
and that just isn't working anymore. And that's leaving you feeling disillusioned and feeling uh, burdened by the weight of the walls that you've created. And this may be a time where you're going off in search of, uh, maybe this is a humbling moment. Uh, I believe Pisces is a very humbling sign where we you know, start to realize that what we've been building in this material reality is, is not always a, a perfect reflection of the idealized spiritual reality. Uh, and like with, with my example with Neo in the Matrix, he's doing his you know, automaton thing in, the, in the, his cubicle and he finally is starting to, he has a, a call to adventure, you know, like there's something that happens that is out of the ordinary that, that causes him to wake up from his material reality into a more spiritual reality, into a, into a special world, so to speak. That's what Joseph Campbell calls it, the special world. And I think that we may be called to wake up from our ordinary world and have a call to adventure and see where... Uh, our disappointment with what we've been creating materially could potentially lead us to a different expression of that, a different journey. Um, this is Jupiter in Pisces, or, Ju or Jupiter in general, when it's trying to function in a Piscean manner, I think is more about the inter internal journey. Uh, when we have Jupiter in, in ruling Sagittarius, that's about the actions and the journeys that we're taking in, in the external world that are more visible. These are the hidden journeys we're taking in our own mind, in our own spirit, in our own imagination. So this could be the search for a new vision, a new hope. Uh, where will you build your new dream? Uh, potentially, there may be new ground that you're trying to build in a very, very different way. See Mars, Uranus, a very different way than you're used to. Okay, and you've got to use that kind of army general mind to strategize some kind of new new hope. Okay, uh, this could be the beginning of your own hero's journey, and you, you, it may be something where you're going internally to to go into the belly of the whale. Okay, right? We all are going to have a dark night of our soul in this journey. This may be the dark night of our soul where we're going into the be belly of the whale and having to become the hero of our own story to create that new start. You know, birthing something new, it can be painful. There's always growing pains and birthing pains associated with that. And it, you may feel like you're going back into the womb uh, to really get in touch with your inner essence and your inner core. Like I would just caution you though, that this new identity may cause some friction with the people in your life because they have put you in, an, in a, we always put people in categories, I think. And this is what we've seen in the news. We have people that are putting people in certain categories and defining them by their role in society and, and their status and all these things. And that's a mistake because we're just, we're spirit souls, right? We're not just uh, men. We're not just women. We're not just of a certain demographic. We're, we're souls. And when we get to see, when we reach out and we view the divinity within each other, that's when we start bridging the gaps. And I think that that's what this divine assignment, this new moon in Pisces is all about, is how do you reach out and see the divinity within one another rather than just seeing the material form that, that, that we, we've taken, the differences, the differences in status, the differences in race, or the differences in like, you know, I don't know, wealth, all of these things, like those are the things that divide us in material reality that aren't necessarily fair. And when we can, when we connect with seeing, treating everyone that this is, here's, here's my last little soapbox. When we talk about the, the American uh, things that we're going through uh, and we talk about the constitution and the, I think the essential nature of what the founding fathers were trying to do in this country is they say that all men are created equal, right? All people are created equal. And I think what it, it, essentially what they're saying is we are all spirit souls that are, have, should be treated equally spiritually, right? And, and on a spiritual level, we're all equal. That is not true in material reality. That is unfortunate, but that is an ideal or an, essen an essence to strive for. And the more that we can get closer to that spiritual ideal and close the gap, the more we're going to be living from our higher selves rather than from this base material self. And, and it will, the nature of reality is it's never going to be completely ideal. 
this is the other thing about Pisces is that Pisces is about uh, learning about the imperfections of trying to manifest an ideal into material form. And unfortunately, there will probably, as, as long as there is life and humanity, be some sort of inequality. We just aren't all created the same in these bodies. That does not mean, though, that we shouldn't strive to attempt to treat each other as fairly as we can based on a higher spiritual truth. All right? So that is what I've got for the new moon. Uh, the last thing I'll say about Venus square Jupiter, which is an aspect that perfects, is this is the first quarter of the Jupiter-Venus cycle where we're going to see maybe some crisis about bringing something into being. The seed of this cycle was Venus conjunct Jupiter on the 24th of November uh, 2019, so around um, Thanksgiving at 28 degrees of Sagittarius. Uh, and this is where we may see a little bit of an overindulgence, hubris, grandiosity of vision, um, too much of a good thing, decadence, desire, Venus in Aries, aggressive desire, uh, meets material ambition, Jupiter in Capricorn. So connect with the essence of your plan, not just the imagined rewards is the, the note that I wrote down for this. These are benefics that are making contact with each other. So uh, just be careful of overdoing something. All right. So that's what I've got. I think we did pretty good. I thought we, I don't know how long this took us, but we're coming in at a decent, decent amount of time. Looking ahead to next week, the 24th through, through uh, March 1st, the sun will be sextiling Mars. We'll have Mercury starting a whole new cycle uh, when it goes Kazemi it, with its inferior conjunction uh, on the 25th. Mercury retrograde will then sextile Mars. Um, Venus will be squaring Pluto. That'll be Excuse me, that'll be interesting. And then Mercury retrograde will make a sextile to Uranus next week. All right, that's what I've got. So thank you for hanging out with me today. Uh, remember that we, um, this podcast now is on Apple Podcasts, so make sure you subscribe there. If you uh, consume this content through YouTube, uh, make sure you subscribe and share on YouTube. Visit the blog, spencermichaud.com. Uh, if you want to contribute to the work, uh, there is like little tip jar links basically with uh, PayPal me and Ven Venmo. That's all, always appreciated. Or just set up a reading. That would be great. And remember that I've got a, a, a month ahead reading with Melissa LaFara of Energetic Principles coming out um, very early Monday morning. So check that out. It's going to be fun. And uh, I hope that you are all doing well this week and that your inner journeys are fruitful. All right, everyone. Take it easy. Peace. <laughs>